I had the uh, these, uh, this electoral transition, so just sort of that random. Um, I could actually ask you to, to uh, actually, I can't because you can read the little side notes. But just a, a series of. Are you doing press hit present? Yeah, could, could we have it a little bit longer there, Jim? There you go. Okay. So, 1920. <laughs> so this is just great. This is, again, you know, just a perfect example of the South and South. So this is 1920. Who got elected in 1920? Warren Gamaliel Hardy. Warren G. Hardy. This was the, this was the, this was the famous smoke film room. Yeah, yeah so the smoke film room in the hotel in Chicago, where, where they basically were a bunch of the Republican Party fixers in a smoke filled room decided who the next president would be, and they picked a nebbish. Uh, well, nothing that Democrat Party has ever done. Necessarily a nebbish. <laughs> one of the reasons that they picked him was what happened for the first time in the 1920 election? Somebody remember that? Yes. Women wrote, right? So that's the first Rebel. election after the suffrage amendment. And so. Some of these Republican movers and shakers thought, you know what? If we get a guy who's really good looking, that might help us get the female vote. And Harding was considered to be kind of a stud. Not a nephish, but a stud. So, and and that, Harding actually, what Harding was doing in his whole office thing, like Bill Clinton was doing, put it in the shade. But, um, no comment. But, that's not on the table. Anyway, I just picked this one. So, this is a big Republican landslide election, right? Republicans dominate this election, 1920, it's after World War One, But it just is a perfect example of the, the solid South, right? So the blue states, I mean, what we think of the, of the red states are historically the blue states. We're all the way back to Reconstruction, right? Democrats were the party of white supremacy. The Republicans were the party of abolition, the party of Reconstruction. If you were a white Southerner, you'd rather die for one. And if you remember the conversation we had one with Governor Winter and, forgive me, the... the Marty Wiseman. Yeah. With, you know, that, that even in Mississippi, even after Mississippi sort of flips over presidential elections, in state elections, it's still a solidly democratic state. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, the first time that, that in the state of Mississippi that the Republican Party has controlled both houses of the state legislature and the governorship, I think it's right now. Since Reconstruction. Since Reconstruction, right? If you had the map of 1896 and you compared it to the map of 2000, the Bush Gore map, the maps look exactly the same except that the colors are flipped. So here you see the solid Democratic South don't know what was going on with Tennessee. But otherwise, these are the only... Yeah, no, 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 you know what's going on with Tennessee. Yeah. Why, why, yeah, red? why is Tennessee red? Come on, Gina, it's too easy. It's called the um, Scopes Trot. It's the it's the it's the Mountain Republican. Yeah. So Tennessee. Yeah, you know, those Eastern Eastern Tennessee never went with the Confederacy. All you know. Eastern Tennessee you know, had Republican congressmen through most of the whole late nineties, early nineties. Get two inside baseball. <laughs> but anyway, so this is nineteen twenty. This is the Solid South. So um, and it's basically the eleven states of the old Confederacy. What election is that? 56. <clears throat> well, what what makes this map different from all the others, you think? Undecided. The libertarian vote's in yellow. Well, okay, so there's three, three different colors. Three different colors. It's not libertarian. It is the Dixon Cranks. That's right. Dixon Cranks. 1948. So this is when, remember part of what we talked about earlier was there's, there's some interesting stuff comes out of the war, right? I mean, wars historically are really interesting times for historians. And if you're, if you're a leader of a society, you better think very carefully before you go into a war because wars unleash forces and processes that are deeply unpredictable. And so the Second World War produces all kinds of extraordinary changes. Joe referred to I mean, the Great Migration had been going on since the 19-teens, but a massive movement of, of Southern blacks into places like Chicago, which, you know, in terms of total numbers, vastly outstrips the so-called Great Migration of the teens and 20s. And so the constituency of the Democratic Party starts changing. 
you get the GI, you get new forms of social welfare. We haven't talked about the GI Bill, but a GI Bill that comes out that returning servicemen get federal support to go to college, they get federal support to buy mortgages, to get mortgages. And it's in this context that the Democratic Party increasingly uh, northern, liberal, lots of black voters who've now moved in from the party of Lincoln into the party of Roosevelt. This is when you see Truman desegregating the armed forces. You see a Fair Employment Practices Commission extended from the war to peacetime. You see a Presidential Commission on Civil Rights. Not a lot making a big difference in terms of the lives of black people in a place like Mississippi, but the beginning of a process where the federal government comes increasingly to be counted, or at least symbolically aligned, with the cause of black civil rights. And it's in that context that Joe's guy, Strom Thurmond, runs as the Dixiecrat. Um, and they basically walk out of the Democratic Convention. And they say to Harry Truman, you will never be elected dog catcher when we're done with you. And they do, in fact, succeed in pulling several of the states, conventionally Democratic states. Jim, it's interesting to note in 46 that the vice president candidate was a Mississippian. Um, by the last name of Wright, that runs on the Dixie Crack ticket with, with Thurman and tries to so, so, so solidify that deep south vote. Well, in 48, uh, just like in 1860, the two most fire eating states were South Carolina and Mississippi. And uh, it was in February, early February, that uh, uh, Harry Truman issued a uh, kind of a, a plan for Congress, a civil rights, a series of civil rights uh, pieces of legislation that he introduced. And that's what uh, caused this kind of break. I mean, you know, there had been, the, the South had been pulling away, uh, there had been risks for the Democratic Party leading up to 1948. You know, it really begins, if you want to start, when did the, when did the Democrats start losing the South? You have to go back to 1936. Because, and I'm that's right. Yeah, we don't want to go into all that. But, but anyway, yeah. but but uh, the beginning with the New Deal, beginning with the change to the party in '36. Uh, but in '48, it's the uh, uh, yeah, it's Mississippi and South Carolina that are that are most strident about the civil rights proposals of <coughs> Truman. And Philly Wright, it's this meeting of governors that happens in Florida, outside of Tallahassee. Philly Wright says we got to go. Strong Thurman. <coughs> who ends up leading it, it's, it's actually an odd story because Thurman had been known up to that time as a kind of progressive, relatively progressive governor. He had, there had been a, a very infamous lynching in South Carolina of a black, named, a black man named Willie Earl in 1947. Thurman actually calls in the FBI, which is you know, not anything we're supposed to do in 1947 in South Carolina. But he runs for a lot of reasons specific to South Carolina politics and, and other things. And ends up, uh, the only reason they win those four states, uh, they, he only gets like 2.3 uh, million votes. But they win these states because in these states, the local Dixiecrat organizers were able to have Thurman listed as the official Democratic candidate. And in fact, in Alabama, Harry Truman wasn't even on the ballot. If you wanted to vote for Harry Truman, you had to write him in. So, Just like Abraham Lincoln, you had to write it in the southern states in 1860. Yeah. Okay, so there's 48. So you can, you can begin to see Mississippi as a kind of curious outlier, but you, you get a harbinger here of the solid democratic South in, uh, in a process of change. This is a weird one. Mm -hmm. As Mississippi goes, so goes the nation. <laughs> As Mississippi goes, so goes the nation. You know, uh, this is 1960. This is John Kennedy's election. Again, razor thin. And you can see that there are, you know, the state of Virginia. Nixon carries the state of Virginia in 1960. Nixon carries Florida. He carries Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, Mississippians still aren't ready to vote for a Republican, but they're not going to vote for an Irish Catholic either. 
So they actually, I don't even know, who do they vote for? And, and Ross Barnett's favorite son candidate. And they, have, they just to kind of preserve their independent electors. So they, they, have, they basically vote for an independent elector. So anyway, go ahead. Anyway, and this is a very close election. Neither Kennedy, because of what happens in Mississippi and some other places in the South, neither Kennedy nor Nixon, his Republican opponent, get 50% of the popular vote. Uh, Kennedy gets something like 49.8 or 49.7, and it's a very, very close, and, and, uh, and Nixon is only a couple of tenths of a percent behind. And there's two things that really decide the election. One is that Lyndon Johnson was on the ticket and was able to deliver Texas for the Democrats, which was not a short thing. Texas had gone for Eisenhower in the 1950s. But the other and the key thing was that Mayor Richard Daley, the boss of the Chicago Democratic machine, made sure that every Chicago Democrat, living and dead, voted <laughs> early and often for the Democratic ticket. <clears throat> Now this one we talk about, this is 64, right? 64. This is a landslide Democratic election. This is the biggest <coughs> electoral landslide in American history. Up to that point. Up to this point, right? And, uh, but again, what you've seen here is you still see the solid South, but it's no longer the solid Democratic South, right? It's now all of these people voting for Goldwater against Lyndon Johnson who had just signed the Civil Rights Act. So there's a harbinger here. And so this is why Kevin Phillips, who Bruce was talking about, who's a Nixon strategist in 68, they begin to see that there's areas of the, you know, just like, you know, you put the red states in the Republican column before you even start now. Historically, there are all these states you put in the Democratic column before you even started counting. And basically, the Republicans begin to see that they can begin to pick off and move some of traditionally democratic states into the Republican column because they just didn't have. The other thing that Nixon does is there's there's two different kinds of racial appeals. So one is the appeal to white Southerners against an intrusive federal government. But that Nixon also campaigns a lot around issues that are designed to be coded racial appeals to white northern voters in cities. So he talks a lot about the silent majority, not the loud, not the loud minority that's protesting in the streets, but people who want law and order, the silent majority. And what he's starting to target are people who will be called, become so-called Reagan Democrats, traditionally northern working class voters who vote Democratic, who are susceptible to kind of coded appeals around race. And the calculus is that by picking off parts of the South and parts of those working class white voters in northern industrial areas who have their own racial issues, you can start to move some solid Democratic constituencies into the Republican Party. So then here, this is Nixon uh, running again in, in 68. And he doesn't quite pull it off because these states all vote for George Wall. But again, so they're voting to the right of Nixon, and you can see this process happening. And then I think um, that's seventy-two. This is uh, no, it's not seventy-two actually, because in seventy-two, the only states that McGovern won. This is eight, this is this is eighty-four. Reagan took out Carter. Yeah. This no. This no, is this eighty. This is eighty. This is eighty. This is, this is 80. 72, Nixon won every state but Massachusetts and District of Columbia. This is Reagan's landslide in 1980. Mm -hmm. And now you see, you know, this is the election he kicks off by campaigning at the Chauvin County Fair. And it turned out not he didn't won the election anyway without Mississippi. But you can actually see now that, that you know, the red states are not the All of these, these South states are high, I mean, are really close votes. Uh, I'm trying to remember. This is a George Bush election, George W. Bush election, I believe. And then this is the very last one. Mm -hmm. It's another it's like an 1896. Yeah. Yeah. Because you get all that over. Yes. 
Yeah. So here, you know, here you see, and in fact, so here you see the solid South, which was at the beginning of the 20th century a solid Democratic South, is now a solid Republican South at Sunbelt, and this area, which in 1896 was all Republican, is now all Democrat. And what's fascinating on this map, and if I were a Republican strategist, a little worrisome, is that some <laughs> some states that were once Democrat states became Republican states, now maybe becoming Democrat states. So Virginia has voted for Obama twice. Colorado has voted for Obama twice. Because Obama actually won Florida. That's right. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I actually have, if we have time, it takes two minutes, a Nixon campaign ad from 1968. And it... Did you have any more songs, Chris? Oh, <laughs> I've got four million songs. Joe, I have a question for you. Yeah, while he's setting up. While he's setting up. Yeah. Um, in 1972, we see Big Jim Eastland leave the U.S. Senate. And... The Ed Cochran coming in. 78. Okay. Cochran's like 78. Yeah, 78. Yeah. Um, and, but yet we see John C. Um, Stennis, he survived that shift and that change and continued on serving until mid 80s. Yeah. My question to you is what allowed Stennis? to make that change where Eastland could not make that change with the voters of Mississippi? Well, I mean, Eastland was making that change. You know, Aaron Henry endorses in, uh, Eastland in 1978 before he decides not to run. So one of the stories is just the health. Uh, Eastland was in, had poor health, and, uh, and he dies uh, not too long after he out of office. Um, but there are a lot of, there are uh, a number of old segregationist war horses who hold on, you know, most notably Strom Thurmond, right? Both uh, Strom Thurmond and John Stennis vote for the reauthorization of the Voting Rights uh, Bill in 1982 in a big reversal of fortunes. Uh, now, for, for Stennis, what's interesting to me about the difference between the Repub a Republican like Thurmond, you know, who switched in 64, and Stennis, if you're a Democrat and you stay in office, you got to have a public kind of come to Jesus moment. You got to have the moment where you say, because if you're going to continue to win election in a Democratic primary, you're going to have to win with black votes, or otherwise somebody's going to challenge you. Uh, so Stennis has that moment, you know, where he, where he says, "Why did you used to do that stuff you used to do? Well, I used to think this way, and then I changed here, and I realized this, and you know, and I and I, I'm a different person now." And Thurman never does that. That Thurman never has a kind of public apology or public kind of you know, accounting for his past segregation uh, positions. And in part, you don't have to do that as a Republican because you don't need any black votes to win a Republican primary, right? Because there are no, there are no uh, blacks who voting Republican. So it's a different, it, 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 it lends itself, the difference uh, partisan affiliation, it means a different kind of way in which the past is remembered or not remembered and not accounted for.